Well, I've been making things since my teens, and although wood is my preferred primary material, I'll use whatever material suits the purpose. This short video is about a wooden clock I designed and made over 40 years ago, and which in 2016, the lady who commissioned me got in touch and asked me to repair it. She's now 80 years old. Yes, this is the actual clock made for her in 1975, a design I'd created three years previously. I made them initially from pine and then in a variety of attractive timbers. My late half-sister Barbara Brun, a highly skilled decorative painter, hand-painted some of them using a brush flicking technique. This one is in a granite type finish. I called it the universal clock because it used a simple ball and socket joint which allowed the head to be swivelled in any position. It's a piece of functional sculpture really and I use a Youngham's quartz movement, the cheapest part of the clock and the one that fulfills the primary function. Actually it's not the cheapest part of the clock and this illustrates how designing something relies on thinking outside the box. Back in 1972, faced with the prospect of spending thousands of pounds having a mass-produced plastic bezel made, and bearing in mind I couldn't find a high street shop uh, to sell my innovative clock to, I found the solution in a piece of 4-inch PVC drain pipe that I adapted on the lathe. Now this was decades before 3D printing. I used acrylic sheet for the clock face which I cut and shaped with basic tools and I also used tiny cupboard ball catches to hold the bezel. Actually this allowed for the movement of the solid wood ball and over 40 years the wood has predictably shrunk. It was a miracle I was able to still get hold of a new Youngham's clock movement so I'm not the only one going strong after 40 years. Now this clock is close to my heart because it's part of the story of my early survival as a designer maker. In 1972 I left a secure teaching job and helped set up a crafts commune near Glastonbury. It was an unrealistic dream and I was forced to leave after only six months and I moved to Bath to try my luck. I had no base but I had designed the clock whilst at the Dove Centre. I hawked it around the jewellery shops in Bath in a bag by closing time I was exhausted and depleted by the rejection and landed up at the main county jewellers, I think they were called Gilmers. When I asked to see the boss, the sales girl said he was on the phone. I suddenly snapped, well flash this photograph in front of him and get a yes or no. I broke all the rules of sales negotiation and courtesy. Well the boss, Mr Gilmer, immediately ended his phone call and came to the sales counter and offered a handshake. Well, I immediately apologised for my abrupt manner, but explained that everywhere was rejecting my design. He said, I like it, and I'll buy 12 of them, as I'm part of a nationwide group of jewellers. I had no workshop and no lathe at this point, but with a decent order in the bag, I now had the finance to rent a workshop. And in fact, my first workshop cost me three pounds a week. Now, the twist to this story is uh, today's world is very different. I've just backed two Kickstarter projects for smartwatches. The first one I'm still waiting for over a year. Millions of dollars are raised in advance, but the difference between my handmade clock and these high-tech devices, which interestingly offer the kind of abstract clock faces I was pioneering over 40 years ago is that my product was proven before I took it to market. My only problem really was selling it. These Kickstarter projects are often launched before the product is sorted. Now if I've got any message in this video it's about the huge value in making things, creating things, solving the problems as you go along and trying to make things that last there's a great satisfaction in using basic tools, improvised materials. I even used the same acrylic sheet I bought 40 years ago to remake the dial and glass for this clock. Yes, a little scratched over the passage of time. 
but isn't that what the antique guys call patina? Now I could have re-sanded the clock to take out the dents where the ball was dropped, but anything that ages will have a few blemishes, and that doesn't exclude me. Thanks for watching. But to help me check that it's circular, I use the perimeter of the plastic component, which is perfectly circular. And just rotate that around and watch for the shadow lines. Mm -hmm.